Hello everyone. Today we are going to go through chapter 10, some lessons from capital market history. With the S&P 500 returning about 2% in year 2011, the stock market performance was okay. However, investors in software company eGAN Communications had to be happy about a 400% return in their stock. And investors in semiconductor company Silicon Motion Technology had to fear at least pretty good following that company's 382% return. However, investors in First Solar were probably not so sunny about their stock's 74% decline during the year, while stock in Alpha Natural Resources dropped 66%. These examples show that there were tremendous potential profits to be made during year 2011, but there was also the risk of losing money and a lot of it. So what should you as investor market investor expect when you invest your own money? In this chapter, we will study more than eight decades of stock market history and to find out. And before we go through the major content of this chapter I would like to show you what's happening in recent in recent stock market I just opened a web page on Yahoo Finance and here it show you a lot of information about what's going on on this capital markets including stocks bonds and other financial instruments as you see here I click on the percentage gainers of the stock market and as you see this leading brands Inc company had returned more than 50% return for just today and today is July 14th of year 2016 so if you have $1,000 invested in this stock today you already made more than $500 of it while some investors are making big money in their investment, others may not be that happy. For example, if you invested in a company called Infinity Pharmaceutical, today would be a really bad day for you guys because, as you see, stock price declined tremendously today and uh, uh, your investment has lost more than two-thirds of it because the return here, as you see, is 68% decline. Now let's look at the average stock return measured by S&P 500. And here is the price chart for S&P 500. Let's look at the most recent history of S&P 500 in year 2016. At the beginning of this year, December 31st of year 2015, the S&P 500 was at 2043.94. As of June 13th of year 2016, the S&P 500 is 2072.68. And annual return, annual return since December 31st of last year was about 1.5%. So if you invest in stock market and uh, the average return that you will get for this year so far is about 1.5%. Pretty good. However, if you invest in the stock of Lending Club Corporation, you won't feel very happy about it because during the last 52 weeks or one year, the stock price has declined tremendously from $17.50 to $4.30. Essentially, th third, I mean, three quarters of investments are basically gone and investors will suffer from negative 75% return on this individual stock. So what can you say? As investor, you may make a lot of money. However, you may have a chance to lose a lot of it. 
not just on annual basis but on the daily basis and this chapter and the next chapter will take us into a new territory the relation between risk and return as you will see the chapter has a lot of very practical information for anyone thinking of investing financial assets such as stocks and bonds suppose you were to uh, you were to start investing in stock today do you think your money would grow at an average rate of return of 5% per year or 10% or 20% this chapter gives you an idea of what to expect and also it will show how risky certain investment can be and it give you the tools to think about risk and the return relationship now let's go back to the chapter the key, uh, I mean, in this chapter, we will learn how to calculate returns on an investment. And the second, we'll look at historical returns on various types of investments. And also, we will look at historical return risks on various types of investment. And also, we will discuss some implications of market efficiency. And here is the cap. Uh, the chapter online. First of all, we will we will look at how to measure returns in dollar amount and in percentage. Then we will look at historical returns for several different financial instruments such as stocks, bonds, and so on. And uh, then we will calculate every returns of different financial instruments during the last 86 years. And also we will look at the variability or the riskness of those different investments and the last topic that we will discuss is the capital market efficiency now first first let's take a look at what we can learn from the capital market history during the last 80 years also and what I can say here is you will see two very important points first there's a reward for bearing risk and the second the greater the potential rewards the greater the risk essentially we will learn the trade-off between risk and return there's no free lunch if you want to make returns then you have to bear risk now let's take a look at how to measure returns there's two different ways first is to look at the dollar amount of returns and the second is to look at the percentage returns and the total dollar return equals return on an investment measured in dollars for a typical stock investment your dollar amount of return has two parts the first one is the dividend revenue and the second one is capital gains the capital gains are calculated as a difference between price received minus price paid the total percent return equals return on an investment measured as percentage of original investment and the percentage return equals dollar amount of return divided by dollar amount of investments now let's take a look at some details of percentage returns and the dividend yield can be calculated as as the ratio of dividend paid in a stock divided by the initial price of the stock and the capital gain yield can be calculated as the difference between today's stock price and initial stock price divided by initial stock price and the total percentage return of stock investment equal to dividend yield plus capital gains yield a little complicated in terms of mathematical equation but let's take a look at an example to see how we can calculate total dollar and the total percent returns for a typical stock investment let's say you invest in a stock with a share price of $25 after one year stock price goes up to $35 and during that year each year paid $2 dividend so what would be your total return measured by US dollars and in percentages and this table show you very clearly that dollar returns has two parts first one is two dollar dividend and the second part is capital gain which is the difference between thirty five dollars and twenty five dollars so in total 
investor made ten dollars of capital gain and two dollars dividend revenue, and the total return here is twelve dollars. And in terms of percentage, the dividend yield equals two dollar dividend, dividend divided by stock price twenty five dollars. That is eight percent. And the capital gain equals ten dollar capital gain divided by stock price twenty five dollar. That is forty percent. And the total return measured by percentage is forty eight percent for this stock. Now let's take a look at an eighty eighty six years uh, history of uh, of the capital market during nineteen twenty five to year two thousand eleven. And here, in this in this figure, we will see several different financial instruments. They are treasury bills, long-term government bonds, large company stocks, and small company stocks. As you see, one dollar invested in tw in nineteen twenty-five will grow into fifteen. More than fifteen thousand dollars. If you invested in a small company stock, oh my goodness, one dollar transformed into fifteen thousand dollars. But if you invest in large company stock, your gain will be much less. One dollar can be transformed into three thousand dollars for eighty-six years. But if but invest but. If you invest in long-term government bond, your gain will shrink to one nineteen dollars. And if you invested in treasury bills, that is twenty dollars. As you know, there's inflation during that time period, and the inflation is about twelve hundred percent, which means one dollar in nineteen twenty-five was twelve dollars in year two thousand eleven. So, as investor, which one would you like to invest in in the future? Many people would say, "Hey, small small company stocks it generate the greatest gain during the past, and if this continues, then if you invest one dollar today, and after eighty six eighty six years, it will be transformed into fifty thousand dollars." Is that true? Many people say yes, but I would say wait a second, wait a second, because there is a risk-return trade-off. Now let's take a look at some detailed year-to-year -to -year total returns for many different financial instruments. And Figure ten point five showed you year-to-year -to -year total returns for large cap or large company stocks from nineteen nineteen twenty-five to year two thousand eleven. And as you see, in most years, large company stock generated positive returns. It can be as high as more than fifty returns. However, in some years, it can generate it can generate negative returns. For example, in 1933, if you invest in large company stocks, you you already lost more than forty percent of your investments. So. Investing in large company stock is not safe. In most years, you make money, but in some unfortunate years, you may lose money, and uh, maybe a lot of it, more than twenty percent, more than forty percent of it. Now let's take a look at year-to-year -year return for small company stocks. And here, those in those positive years, investor can make. Tremendous amount of return on the investment. For example, in 1934, if you invested in small stock, you'd already made more than 100 returns. However, in some bad years, you may lose more than 50% of your investments. So, compare large company stock return and a small company return uh, and a small company returns. What can you say? I would say for small companies, you had a chance to make more money, but you also had a chance to lose more money. In other words, investing in small company is riskier than investing in large companies. Now let's take a look at your investments in those relatively safer financial instruments, like long-term government bonds and U.S. Treasury bills. 
In the figure 10.7 show you that long-term government bonds is not 100% safe because in some years, investors can lose significant amount of, uh, amount of losses. For example, in year 2008, investors can lose nearly 20% of their investment in long-term government bonds. And in some good years, investors can make more than 20 or 30 percent returns. But overall, you would say, hey, long-term government bonds is safer than a small company and a large company because in most years, investors make positive returns. What about the treasury bills? And uh, the figure for treasury bills show you that during the last 86 years from 1925 to year 2011, there's no single year that investor can suffer from any losses. And all returns are positive. However, those returns are much lower than the return that you can get for long-term government bonds or small stocks or large stocks. And uh, in the best year, cherry bills returned about 14%. And in most years, returns are something from 2% to 5%. But the good thing about treasury bill investment is investors don't need to worry about any losses because your investment is pretty safe. That's why on capital market, people view treasury bills as so-called risk-free asset. There's no chance that investor can lose money on treasury bills. This figure showed you year-to-year -year percentage change in CIP. What is CIP? CIP is Consumer Price Index. And that is a matrix that investors use to measure inflation because money has time value and over time money loses value. And $1 in year 1926 equivalent to $12 in year 2011. And you see how quickly money can lose value. And here you see the history of inflation during that time period. And in some years you see pretty severe inflation, such as the years in 1940s, years in late, and late 1970s and early 1980s. And inflation rate can be as high as 10%, 15% or even higher. But in most years, inflation is uh, pretty stable, something around 3%, 5%, 2%, or even lower. Now, let's summarize a little bit uh, what we can learn from American capital market history during that 86 years time period. On average, large stocks generate about 12% average annual returns. And a small star did better, that is 16.5%, which is the highest one. If investors invested in long-term copy bonds or government bonds, their return would be something around 6%. And the average return for U.S. Treasury bill is 3.6%, while the inflation during that time period is about 3%. And the annual return is calculated in this fashion. Historical annual return, average return equals the sum of yearly return and divided by number of years. For example, uh, the sum, for, uh, sum of the return for large cap stocks from 1926 through year 2011. Then you divide that with six, 86 years, that will give you 11.8% average and return for large cap stocks. If, if the history can continue into future as of today, your best guess for the size of the return for a year selected at random for large cap stock investment would be something around 11 to 12 percent. So let's take a look at this table again. Here you see 
Here you see if you invest in stocks, you'd earn much higher returns than investing in bonds as well as treasury bills. So what explains the differences in those returns? And many many people would say, hey, since stock, uh, I mean, since stock stock, I mean, small stocks earn highest highest return, then in the future I will invest in, I will invest all my money in, in in small stock. Is that is that a good strategy? Maybe yes, maybe no. Right? If you say yes, you probably ignore another important aspect of investment, which is risk. Because if you invest in small stocks, you had a greater chance to lose money in certain years. And here we are going to introduce a very important concept of risk premium. Before we uh, look at what is what is risk, risk premium, let's take a look at what is risk-free asset and risk-free rate. And investors do not like risk because risk means potential to lose money. And from history, you already see that if you invested in treasury bills. It's essentially risk-free because there's no chance that you can lose money. And returns on treasury bills are always positive. It never goes into negative territory. So the, so the investment return on treasury bill can be viewed as risk-free rate of return. Now, let's take a look at what, what is risk premium. Risk premium is the excess return on risky asset over the risk-free rate. So here, risk premium help us to measure the rewards for bearing risk. The reason why you see the return in small stock is much higher than return in treasury bill because investors bear a lot more risk in their investments. And those risks will be rewarded. And it has been rewarded by the market and will be rewarded by the market in the future. And risk premium measures the rewards for bearing risk. Now let's take a look at historical risk premiums for five different financial instruments. For large stocks, the historical average risk premium is about 8.2%, which means if investor invest in large stocks, investor made 8.2% more return each every year than U.S. Treasury bills. And that amount of return is rewarded for bearing actual risk in larger stocks because uh, from history you see that if, uh, I mean, if, you, if you invest in larger stocks, you had a chance to lose a lot of money in certain years. And for small stocks, since risk is higher, the return is greater. Risk premium based on that time period is nearly 13%. And the risk premium for, uh, for long-term copy bonds is a little less than 3% or 2.8%, and the risk premium for long-term government bonds is 2.5%. By definition, U.S. Treasury Bill has zero risk premium because it doesn't carry any risk. Now let's take a look at another picture of riskiness of stock returns. And here you see a distribution of stock market returns during that time period. And the return ranges from negative 80% to 90%. As you see in the middle, around 10% you see more years. And uh, for extreme high returns, extremely low returns such as 1954-1933 they're only two years and uh, for extremely negative return years there's only few of them 1931 year 2008 1937 so on so forth so from this picture you see that stock market return follows a distribution and uh, we have more years concentrated in the middle or the average level around 10% also, low returns, extremely low returns, and high returns are possible, but the odds are much smaller on both ends. Now, let's take a look at how we can measure risk. I mean, risk 
is the potential to lose a lot of money for your investments. And uh, from the distribution picture, we know that we can borrow some statistics terminology, helping us to quantify the magnitude of return uh, uh, of risks. I'm sorry. And uh, those two terminologies, those two term terminologies are variance and standard deviation, VAR or standard deviation. And the variance can be calculated based on this in, uh, this this formula. It equals it equals okay. The sigma means the sum of many different items, and here you see the difference of individual and individual years return R I and R bar, uh, which is the average return. So when you take the difference between individual years return and average return, you get the deviation of return on that year and for some year the number is positive for some for other years it can be negative so in order to capture the total variation we take the square so all the variations are positive then we put those items together divided by number of year minus one that's how we calculate variance the standard deviation is the square root of variance. Once again, if you hate mathematical formulas like that, I think it's okay. But uh, when we go through an example, then you will have much better idea in how to calculate variance and a standard deviation for a series of stock returns. Now, Let's take a look at this example. In this example, we have five-year observation from 1926 to 1930. As you see, returns are very different. In 1930, the return is negative 25%, and in year, two, uh, year, year 1927, that is 37%. So essentially, we see variation in returns during that five years. And the average return is 11.5%. And in column 4, we, we look at the differences between individual year's return and average return, average returns. For example, in year, in year 1926, the difference equals individual year's return 11.14% 11 minus 11.48%. That is negative 0.34 percent and in year 1929 the yearly return is negative 8.91 percent and every return is 11.8 percent and the difference is negative 20.39 percent after you capture all those differences remember to take the square so the, all the items are positive when you make all the items are positive, we are capturing the variance on both directions, right? on the positive side and on the negative side. And the sum of the squares equals 3,436.77. When, when, when you divide that number with 5 minus 1, 5 years, number of years, you will get a variance, 859.9. Right. And uh, this number equals, in real number, equals 0 0.0859.19 because when you use square percentages, you have, uh, you have four zeros after that point. To calculate standard deviation, you simply take the square root of the variance. And here, the result is 29.19. 31. And this number is in percentage. The real number is 29.3% or 0 0.293. Now let's take a look at distribution of historical average return and standard deviation. We have seven different financial instruments from small stocks to large company stock, long-term copy bonds, long-term government bonds, 
intermediate term government bonds, U.S. Uh, treasury bills, as well as inflation. And on the first column, you see arithmetic mean, that is average return, average return. On the second column, you see standard deviation in percentages. And the standard deviation, once again here, is a proxy for riskiness of the financial instruments. And on the third column, you see the distribution of returns of those different financial instruments. And this figure showed you risk return trade-offs of various financial instruments. Once again, the average return gives you the idea of how much return that you can get for a certain financial instruments and the standard deviation here measures risk. A lot of people like small stocks. I like small stocks as well because it generates highest return. But remember, high return goes with high risk. And here, small stock has highest standard deviation, 32.5%. Which means investor will have greater probability to lose a lot of money. And for large company stocks, it generates lower return, which is a little less than 12%, but the risk is much smaller than small company stocks. Standard deviation is around 20%. And investors hate risk. If they are seeking safe investments, such as long-term copy bonds or long-term government bonds, the standard deviation is much lower. For long-term copy bonds, the standard deviation is about eight is is about eight percent, and for long-term government bond is about ten percent. But the return here is much lower. You see that once again, there's a risk return trade-off. If you want safe investment, that you have to withstand low return and uh, every return for those two safe investments are around six percent and for US Treasury bills the standard deviation is as low as 3.1 percent which means there's essentially no risk investing in US Treasury bills and however the return is pretty low 3.6 percent which is very close to inflation. Right? So if investing in treasury bills is safe, however, you should not expect to earn a lot of money in that investment. So far, we look at the history of American capital markets from 1926 to year 2011. That 86 years capital market his history showed us a very clear risk return trade-offs for different financial instruments and many people like to invest in small stock but it is most risky instruments that you can find in this class and if you are seeking safe investments such as the US Treasury bills then your return need to be compromised overall there is risk, re there's risk return trade-off. Alright, if you have questions, please, please drop those questions in to D2L or send me email. This is Kevin Zhao, your finance professor. It's my pleasure discussing those important topics with you guys today. And uh, let's take a break and uh, we will go through more materials in chapter 10 in the next video. Thank you so very much.